threatened to quit to alternative jobs. And this really, in our conceptualization of competitive markets, regulates wages uh, in, in market economies uh, with impacts on you know, all sorts of things uh, outside of the labor market even, prices, productivity, output. And the question really I'm trying to investigate in this question is, in this, in this paper, is how relevant is this in South Africa, uh, especially given our high underemployment? It's a labor surplus country. We might think that in developing countries, uh, kind of competitiveness is a little bit different. Uh, the, there isn't that much evidence uh, on, on these kind of uh, economies. A second kind of implication of this is that um, I want to argue that, that, there's the, that these kind of the, the implication of, of monopsony in South Africa, which I'll, I'll lead to, uh, really provides this interesting link between our high level of unemployment and our high inequality, uh, which, as we know, there are plenty of historical drivers, uh, for example, through apartheid policy, the, jo the job structure that was created. Um, but uh, you know, this might be a link that uh, is a continuing link uh, through firms and through monopsonistic competition that keeps high unemployment, uh, that, that travels from our high employment towards uh, our high inequality. Okay, so uh, to move straight forward into what this, uh, the roadmap of this, of this presentation, I'm going to start off with some, uh, to talk a little bit about what we think are indicators of uh, competitiveness of the labor market. Uh, two key indicators are firm wage premia, and I'll give evidence on that. A second key indicator is rent sharing. I'll give evidence on that. Uh, then I'll talk about different explanations uh, for these wage premia and rent sharing, focusing on monopsony power, but also addressing unions, which is, uh, uh, you know, there's quite a big South African literature on unions. Okay. So to head directly into the data that I'm using in the study, um, this is matched employee-employee data from, uh, I'm currently in, in the data center right now, so uh, uh, I'm using 2011 to 2016. Uh, it's a new, near universe of all uh, formal sector workers. Uh, sorry, ignore this, there's definitely not any hours. <laughs> um, and I'm focusing on workers in the firms with greater than 20 workers. So the, this is uh, mostly a, a large firm uh, analysis, but that doesn't really affect the, um, reduce the numbers that much. So if we, this is 2011, 2016, some descriptive the stat statistics. If you look at 2013, for example, uh, uh, you know, out of around 10 and a half million jobs that are observed in the formal sector in, in the data, uh, nearly 9 million uh, are still in my sample of large firms. Um, and uh, that uh, corresponds to around 45,000 firms. Uh, and about 85% of those firms have sales data, uh, which is relevant, as I'll tell, say later, for my rent sharing estimates. Okay, so to the, this question about are there rents in the labor market? And just to take a step back here, when we talk about a competitive labor market, as we say, uh, it means that workers can credibly threaten to leave to another job. And that means that similar workers are paid similar amounts because if, you, if you're underpaid relative to what you can get at another job, then you leave towards that other job that pays you your correct amount. In a less competitive setup, it means that similar workers earn uh, different amounts. And the reasoning here is that, for example, low earning workers, so firms that pay workers under what you know, similar workers could get elsewhere in the economy, these low earning workers can't easily switch into the good jobs in the economy. Even though the worker that does have that good job has very similar characteristics, the worker in the low earning or bad job uh, can't easily find or switch into that good job. And the reasons are, there are a bunch of reasons, but the reasons I'll investigate later on is about monopsony or unions. The bottom line here is that as indicators of less competitive markets, we can look at firm wage premium. So for similar workers, are, are very similar workers paid very different wages depending on the firm they're at? Uh, that's an indicator of less competitive labor markets. And then rent sharing. So rent sharing is about are these uh, firm wage premium correlated with the profitability or productivity of that firm? And that really tells us that it's really something about the firm that's causing these firm wage premium, not something else like 
uh, you know, uh, higher wages in, in Johannesburg compared to, to uh, uh, you know, more rural areas in order to compensate for something. So just to take a quick break and to engage everyone, I'm gonna launch a quick poll here um, at this point. It should be on your screen. And I want to ask you, what proportion of total inequality, so this is of all inequality, any type of inequality, uh, obviously income inequality, uh, in South Africa, do these firm wage premia explain? Uh, and you've got an option of saying, I don't believe there's any firm wage premia, or, or at least there's it's very little part of, of it. Uh, you know, uh, you can say it's very little, 5%. Some people might say more, 20%. Others might say, might say a bit more, uh, 40%. I'm going to wait for maybe 10 more seconds, 20 more seconds. Just choose. Okay. I'm going to end the poll now. Uh, and it seems like, ah, so hopefully everyone can see the, see the poll results. And we see, huh, everyone believes that there are some firm wage premium. So, so um, uh, and the, the kind of uh, uh, over half said it's 20%. Some people say 5%, some, some people say 40%. Maybe I'm, I'm bad at setting questions because it was clearly in the middle 20%. That's what, that's, that's what I'm gonna try to convince you is the, is the approximate answer, um, but we'll see that later. Okay, so that's interesting. So to head into, this, into the firm wage premium. So this is really a non-parametric non uh, setup of, of the first kind of, are there firm wage premium? And here, this is a very standard kind of um, graph in the literature. Uh, to take you very slowly through this graph, if we look at, for example, this line over here. So this line over here uh, is showing a worker in a quartile one firm. So we're uh, dividing firms by the average wage in their, in their firm uh, by the lowest quartile one to the highest quartile four. So the lowest origin quartile, so the way that way workers start at is all in red. Um, and this, these people over here start at a low wage uh, firm and they go at the event day towards a high wage firm, a, a quartile form firm. And you can see in the y-axis, this shows the mean log wage of these people who are switching firms. And it's kind of incredible because it's um, kind of a, something like a 60% increase in these people's wages, just the same person, the same people, just switching firms from a low wage firm towards a high wage firm. And kind of, even more interesting perhaps is that the opposite occurs where you have someone going from a high wage firm to a low wage firm, they also get a penalty of exactly the opposite, the, the opposite magnitude, the same, the same magnitude of the opposite sign. And so it's really speaking towards these firm wage premium. Another kind of way we can look at this is a kind of matched um, event study design. And this is really to say, well, in this, in this figure, are we really taking care of, are we comparing like with like and so on? There are all sorts of problems you can think of, you can, you can, uh, you can point out. This, this is a much more kind of parametric study where we're trying to control for a bunch of things. And over here, we can take a bunch of people who start at exactly the same firm, um, who are in the same age category are, are of the same uh, sex, um, they earn within the same wage bracket. So these people are very closely matched. And we find that at a certain date, uh, one separates to a high wage firm and another separates to a low wage firm um, where high wage firms determined by the average wage in that, in that firm. And using that kind of design, we can see here that um, a kind of... Uh, there's a large correlation between when you, the people who switch to a high wage firm actually do get a high jump in their wages, despite controlling for all sorts of things. And we have flat pretrends to really show that there's nothing else kind of, uh, there's, there's no like um, uh, pre-characteristic endogeneity that's driving these kind of results. So to get back to the polling question, what does this tell us? This tells us that, uh, if we kind of do take another approach, we, we, we decompose these firm wage premium by saying that wages can be decomposed into a, a worker fixed effect, a firm fixed effect, and a bunch of other stuff. We can do a, a kind of very standard decomposition, a variance decomposition. 
so that we can say that the variance of the log wage in South Africa is around, you know, 1.32. What does that mean? Um, but of that, firm fixed effects uh, account for 23%. Uh, and sorting from high wage for, from high wage workers to high wage firms, the covariance between firm and worker fixed effect account for another eleven percent. Uh, worker fixed effects, so these are kind of immutable characteristic of workers, might include kind of skill, uh, maybe education. Of course, it also includes things like uh, race and sex and so on. Um, it's not. It's actually forty three percent. It's it's not that much. And and just to answer the poll. Uh, this is kind of, if you add up the 23 and 11, that's 34% of uh, formal sector wage inequality. But, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, this research, um, for example, by um, uh, Arden Finn and Murray Labrant and, and, uh, and, and Ingrid Willard that, uh, you know, um, something like 65% of inequality is, is accounted for by by wage inequality, and the rest is about the difference between unemployment and employment. So once we adjust for that, we can say that something like 20%, one fifth of total inequality is accounted for by um, firm wage premium. So that's kind of massive um, in my view. Uh, it's something to take seriously. Uh, and it's a large part of this kind of, the kind of crisis of inequality that South Africa has been having for the last two decades. But uh, we need to be talking about uh, that a lot of that inequality coming from the, the, from the firm side uh, of the labor market. Okay. Now to look at rent sharing, and this is really to say, as I said earlier, are these wage premiums really something driven by the firm? Is it about the firm's profitability? And then in that case, it must be something that about the firm setting wages or maybe unions uh, optimizing at the firm, firm level. But the point is it's about a firm characteristic. And we see here that there's really a strong correlation between value added per worker, or if you take sales, or if you take profitability, no matter what measure you use, and wages, it's a strong positive correlation. And if you look at the kind of estimates that come out of this, if you regress, for example, just a simple regression of um, wages on value added, you get something like 0.3, um, uh, elasticity of 0.3, but we can do all sorts of other things to adjust for all sorts of other uh, uh, things. So for example, standard in the literature is to use the firm wage premium estimated directly. Uh, and we can see the, the estimate comes out to be about 0.15. Uh, if we use only closed firms, so this is to avoid endogeneity of who's switching, also 0.15. We've also got some, est I've also got some estimates of um, if, you, if, you, if you take out, for example, the part of profit that's to do with industry or, um, or location, so you look at really something that's quite specific uh, to the profitability fluctuations year to year, so first differences, uh, in, a firm, in a firm's profitability, if you just take that kind of push, you might argue that's a kind of um, somewhat uh, uh, exogenous push, uh, then you can see wages do change on the order of around 0.2. And these estimates of 0.15 to 0.2 uh, elasticity, so what does that mean? That means that if, um, uh, you know, your uh, uh, your, if, if, if profitability increases uh, by 10%, wages increase by something like 2%, uh, that's higher than what we find uh, in the international literature. Uh, you know, um, generally international literature is something between 0 0.05 and 0 0.15. Okay, so the, the bottom line here is really that there does, in my view, I, I, um, there's some kind of substantial evidence that there is a firm wage premium uh, accounting for a, a large range of concerns, uh, which I haven't gone through totally in, in, this, in, this, in this presentation, but happy to field questions on it. Um, and then, uh, and we can see it almost more directly uh, in the rent sharing as well, uh, higher rent sharing than, than in other countries. And so at this point, uh, I really wanna go into explanations. And one explanation that I just want to quickly overview before entering another poll, is monopsony power. Uh, and what is monopsony power? This is, um, so remember, if you, from the start of, the com the start of this uh, presentation, um, I talked about how uh, a, key, a key constraint on market economies is that workers have the ability to take and to quit. And monopsony is simply saying that quitting a job is costly. And so that means that firms can decrease wages while still retaining their workers. There are many reasons for this. There are a bunch of models that account for it. You can look at search costs. You can look at uh, job differentiation. Um, 
but the point here is, uh, is, is for example, that, uh, that you can test this directly. So if you look at how separations respond when wages increase, if, if separations decrease, then it's really a worker supply side response to wage setting. Uh, and we can also see that uh, monopsony does, as I said earlier, um, hinted at earlier, perhaps form a link between unemployment inequality for South Africa. Uh, so the link is really saying that in high unemployment settings, uh, if you follow a range of models, uh, high unemployment means that there's more monopsony power. One way we can think of this is in, in terms of search costs. Um, if there's a lot of unemployment, you like you get a job. You have to hold on to the job. Uh, if if the firm decides to decrease the uh, decrease the your wage, you're still not going to let go of that job because your alternative is something like unemployment. You can't easily switch towards um, another good job or another job at all. And so, a higher unemployment implies more monopsony power. But more monopsony power also means that there's higher rent sharing, and that really comes from uh, from from kind of model predictions that if, you, um, uh, uh, if, you, if your firm is more pr productive, you're really gonna be increasing uh, the, the number of workers a lot, a, a lot more in order to take advantage of, of, of that kind of profit per worker that you're, you're, you're making. And so that high rent sharing really translates into high inequality. And this is a kind of interesting link to firms between unemployment and inequality that I think warrants a bit more attention um, uh, uh, in the South African context and perhaps for uh, uh, developing countries generally. Monopsony is, you know, something that's, for those people who are less familiar, it's something that's pervasive uh, in, that's been found around the world. There's quasi-experimental evidence in international literature. Uh, there's concentration evidence. So, so monopsony really occurs, can exist, you know, with many firms. Um, you can have even in dense labor, uh, labor markets. So, for example, uh, in a related paper uh, I, I have with co-authors uh, looking at U.S. urban centers, we actually find that urban centers have higher monopsony power um, than even uh, some, some rural areas. Um, uh, you know, in a meta-analysis, uh, developing countries, there are a few key studies, Brazil, India, Mexico, where substantial monopsony power has been found. Um, Question is, uh, are you, does, maybe I'll convince you that there's monopsony power in South Africa. Really interested to, to hear from Rulof, whose, uh, whose paper really, I think, uh, plays well into, into, into a monopsonistic market. Um, but at this point, I want to uh, field another poll uh, and to ask, um, given that everyone is now up to scratch on, on, on what monopsony is, um, why is the South African labor market not more competitive? So you can say, I don't really buy your results on, um, on wage premium. I don't really think there's, 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 there's that much uh, inequality. That'll be your first thing. Maybe you think it's monopsony power. Maybe you think it's, it's unions. Wow. Okay, no, no, no. I need to adjust for, for the, the sampling. Okay, <laughs> don't jump in. Um, very interesting. Okay. I'm very interested uh, if people have answered other, if perhaps you can put in the chat box uh, what those other models you have in mind are. Um, it's an extremely interesting question to me. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let me give it 10 more seconds. And perhaps if anyone, if those people who think it's, it's uh, who, who aren't sold by the, by the evidence I presented earlier, uh, would love some feedback on, 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 you know, the kind of issues you'd have with that. Um, ex I would really appreciate as much feedback as possible. This is to be one of my uh, dissertation chapters. So any feedback is extremely welcome. Okay, so I'm in the poll. Uh, and it seems that, um, the modal response is unions, uh, which I think is a, is a, is a part of the story. Uh, but as I'll say later, I think is, uh, you know, only a part and, and not the whole story. Okay, so I guess I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna try and convince you that monopsony power is more important than, than what the, 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 the polling currently suggests. 
Um, so, uh, to go back to this key test, one thing we can think about is if you look at two, two opposing models, if you look at unions versus um, uh, monopsony power, for example, if a firm increases their wage, what do you expect the response to be in terms of separations? Well, if unions increase, if, 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 we're, if we're traveling up the labor demand curve, uh, as in kind of a right to manage union model, uh, it would be that as wages are increased, then firms need to adjust by decreasing firm size, and so separations would increase. Um, however, in a monopsony model where you're really riding up the, labor, the, work, the firm labor supply curve, it means that uh, workers who, uh, when, when wages increase, workers are more attracted to, towards, the, towards the firm, and so separations actually decrease. Now, it's a bit confusing, but the point is here that also, even in, in a kind of um, uh, uh, we do find uh, a decrease in separations in South Africa, but uh, we also find that the, the responsiveness in terms of separations is, is slow compared to other contexts. And that really points towards the low ability of workers to easily switch to, high, to higher wage firms. And so we can see here, if you regress, for example, very simple regression of wages on, on, uh, on uh, uh, sorry, on separations on, on, on wages without controls um, and adjusting for hires, for example, um, uh, you get an estimate of around a point, uh, a, a point five. So the labor, this is the labor supply elasticity. So how much is the um, kind of dynamic firm size respond to in, increase in, in, the, in the wage? If we add controls, it gets closer to like 0 0.9, 0 0.85. Uh, even in first differences, we get something quite close to 0.8 with large standard errors, but it's, 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 you know, it's, it's bounded um, you know, below, say, uh, 1.5. Uh, and this first differences estimate is really, as I said earlier, if you, look at, if you think about the rent sharing shop, um, when firms uh, with, uh, get a specific shop that's different to their location and different to the industry, and you see their profits change, or sorry, their value added uh, change across years in a kind of stable manner, that's the isolated kind of first differences profit shock. Uh, and we use that shock as a pass through onto how does that profit shock uh, translate into wages in a kind of incidental variable regression to kind of isolate kind of in exogenous increases uh, in, in wages, uh, we see that separations um, decrease in a manner which really implies there's a lot of monopsony power in the, in the labor market. And finally, if you look at the re-separations kind of design, um, which I'm running out of time to, 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 to explain properly, but the point is that uh, this, this uses the kind of matched event study design that I spoke about earlier, where you match workers very finely, as I said, uh, and then two workers go to two separate uh, firms, and you see that wages change a lot. That's kind of exogenous wage increase. What is the re-separations? How, how, how quickly do they separate from that new firm? Uh, again, it's kind of higher than all the other estimates, uh, but compared to the lower, com compared to the um, international literature, it really suggests a lot more monopsony power in South Africa uh, than other contexts. So finally, Marlise, I'm going to have to ask you for, 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 two more, for two more minutes, please. That's perfect. <laughs> so finally, I want to say a little bit about uh, unions, which is the alternative kind of um, explanation of these firm wage premium. And uh, as you know, one model of unions is that as unions bargain for higher wages, this might give a uh, firm wage premium. I mean, one question is that in South Africa, you have unions are really largely um, organized around industry and location. And even once we take out industry and location, we see really strong dispersion in firm wage premium, which really shows that um, unions you know, are an important part of the story because those industry location average firm wage premium are high. But it's really an insufficient in, uh, a part of the story, if I recall correctly, it's something like 40% um, of, of, the, of the total inequalities accounted for by location or industry firm wage premium. Sorry, location of industry wage premium. The other question about unions is that these non-union firms, so if you, if you kind of uh, take industry locations that have an extremely low density of unions, 
non-union firms actually have extremely similar dynamics in terms of substantial dispersion in firm wage premium, and they have large rent sharing. Um, and so one example of this is to show that if you look on the x-axis here, as the, as the share covered by the bargaining council actually decreases, you go towards the left, then you actually see um, the, an increase in the dispersion of, of, of wage premium, which really shows um, a kind of, uh, to, it points towards kind of uncompetitive dynamics that are outside uh, of unions, even though unions may be a, a, a large, a, an important part of it. Okay, and so to end off, uh, I wanted to say a couple of things uh, in, in, in discussion. One is that, you know, I've looked at the formal sector only here, uh, but we can look at very suggestive evidence on the informal sector, for example, from uh, the survey of employed and self-employed. Uh, and we see some kind of, if you look at the very crude rent sharing regression, some, we see similar results. Uh, we also see similar dynamics of, of transitions of workers between formal and informal sector. It's suggestive because it's not the you know, kind of threat to it that I can't um, sufficiently uh, uh, you know, uh, justify. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's consistent with the formal sector evidence. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, as I said, monopsony really perhaps offers a link between the kind of high unemployment in South Africa and the high inequality, uh, which might really generalize the development process. I really talked about that, uh, you know, high unemployment really um, uh, implies higher monopsony power. Another kind of reason it might contribute to inequality is that when you have uneven industrialization, um, it means that some firms are getting, getting much higher productivity than other firms. And so it means that given a constant rent sharing elasticity, there'll be higher kind of uh, rent sharing effects on the inequality distribution given an uneven, uh, given uneven industrialization. And so both of these contribute to really higher wage inequality through firms, through these firm wage premium, uh, through the kind of monopsony channel uh, that I've been uh, talking about. Okay, so to end off with, um, I hope I've convinced you that, that uh, you know, uh, firm wage premium uh, are a large part, an important part of, of uh, South Africa's in, uh, total inequality. Uh, it seems to me, I think quite strongly, that competitive dynamics should not be the baseline assumption uh, when we do economic analysis. Um, in my head, the primary alternative models are monopsony and unions. I hope I've uh, convinced some of you that monopsony is something to think about properly. I agree with you, with a lot of you, that unions are an extremely important, relevant, continuing part of our uh, labor market. Um, and of course, there are several policy implications um, uh, that, uh, that lots of people are hopefully going to be doing work on this, this stuff about ETI. Uh, Josh Butlin I know, is doing a lot of work on that. Uh, I'm doing some work on, on, on uh, unions in monopsonistic contexts um, and so on. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Sorry I had to rush. Um, uh, very happy and, uh, to engage with questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, Isan, uh, for a really wonderful presentation. Um, we will head over to Rudolf um, as a discussant. Um, he'll have about just under 15 minutes. Um, and um, thanks to those who have posted in the chat function. Um, let's attend to those at um, after Rulof's presentation. Over to you, Rulof. Great. Uh, thanks, Isan. Uh, as I told you before uh, the presentation, I, I looked forward to reading this paper. I've been hearing about it for a long time. Uh, I think like a lot of people who work in labor, I've been waiting for someone to, to write this paper for about a decade now. So I'm, I'm very thankful to UniWider and Treasury and to you uh, that we finally got this, this, we're starting to fill this, this big uh, hole in the South African literature on, on wage inequality. So I think that's, that's great. Um, uh, just, um, Rudolf, yeah. I'm not sure if it's only, oh, there we go. Fantastic. There we go yeah. Okay, so the so the motivation for this paper, I think, firstly, is um, that there's this large empirical literature that dates back to the 1950s that have observed that people who look the same and who do similar jobs can earn very different wages in if they work in different industries or different types of firms, right? 
and for a long time, economists have, have speculated this, this may be mainly due to unobservable human capital differences, right? So if some firms attract more resourceful, more hardworking, more intelligent workers, uh, then, then maybe that's why they pay, pay higher wages and, and, and it's all just a productivity story, right? Uh, and I think part of the reason why economists clung to this, uh, this explanation for so long is it, it allowed us to maintain this, this assumption that markets are basically competitive. Um, but, but the useful thing about this, this tax data is Isan observes the wages of workers who switch between different firms which allows him to control for time invariant unobservable human capital differences. And I think most of the unobservable human capital differences that we care about are going to be time invariant. Um, and, and importantly, his paper demonstrates that these, that this is only a part of the story, right? There, even after you control for these things, there are these important firm effects, and and you know, that's that's kind of a big deal. Um, so, so I think that's the first motivation for the paper. The second part of the paper is all about why these firm effects exist. Uh, and the reason why that's important is if firm effects are an indication of monopsony power, then, then that, employs, that, that it implies that, that workers are being exploited and it suggests a more active role for policies to improve the bargaining power of workers, remove informational frictions, reduce uh, the effect of transportation costs. Uh, it may also suggest that minimum wages can increase employment, although only if wages are below a certain threshold. Um, but, but importantly, the, there are other potential reasons for these, for these firm effects, right? They can also occur as a result of uh, differences in capital intensity, skill capital, complementarity, efficiency wages, uh, certain job search models produce them. And, and if, if that's what's really going on, then that would require a different policy intervention. So, so the main results in the paper, firstly, there's, there's kind of the descriptive bit. Uh, and there, Isan tells us that uh, about 25% of total wage inequality is due to firm effects. Uh, that can explain about 60% of the gender wage gap. I don't think you said anything about that today, son, but I, I thought that was quite a striking result. And, and that it explains about 40% of the wage gap between workers at the bottom and the middle of the income distribution. And then uh, Isan also argues that the results are well explained by a model of monopsonistic competition. So, so let me start with a descriptive analysis. So, so the paper actually, so I read a different version of the paper. I think the one Isan presented today was hot off the presses. So in the, in the paper that I read, uh, Isan found that 71% of wage vari variation was due to worker effects. So in the, in the current incarnation of the paper, it's down to 43%, but that's still a lot, right? So, so we know that internationally and in South Africa, uh, we can usually explain about 20% of wage differences uh, 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 with observable human capital, education and, and experience basically. And, and that means that in South Africa, about 23% of the wage gap must be due to, to these unobservable uh, uh, worker effects, right? So that includes racial discrimination, uh, gender discrimination as well, obviously, differences in school quality, household background, social networks. And, and although this isn't what this paper is about and it's not what Isan focuses on, I think that's a big deal, right? So, so these things, the, the paper demonstrates that these things really matter and, and I think that's an important finding. And then uh, the, the other uh, result uh, is that 23% of wage variation is due to firm effects. So, so it's less important than worker effects, but it's still an important source of wage inequality, especially in a country like South Africa where there's so much wage inequality, right? That 23% is, is you know, it, it explains that's that's a larger gap than than in many other countries, um, and 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 understanding why that uh, occurs and and what the policy implications are, I think, is is very important work and and stuff that you know issues that uh, we haven't really thought about um, before. So I think that's great. Um, the other results from the descriptive analysis that Isan didn't focus on, he finds that sixty percent of the gender wage gap is explained by firm effects. Uh, so, so that that blew my mind. I was very surprised by that. So, I think if I understand that correctly, it, it, it suggests that most of gender wage differences exist because most women end up in bad jobs or bad firms that that also pay men similarly low wages. Um, so, I was I'd, I'd be curious to know Isana, how much of that is due to industry effects rather than than firms within an industry that pay different wages. But I, but I do think there is some policy implications to this. I, I mean, I haven't thought about this this uh, a lot, but I, I think it implies that a uh, a legal framework that focuses almost exclusively on getting firms to a specific firm to pay men and women the same uh, wage for the same job 
is missing the bulk of, of why uh, why gender inequality exists, right? So, so, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, let me maybe skip over this next point uh, just for, for, for the purposes of uh, time. Um, the, the second part of the paper is all about why these firm effects exist. And I think that's that's more ambitious, but it's also it's all also more difficult to make that point persuasively, right? So so firstly, Isan finds evidence of rent sharing, right? There's this strong positive relationship between profitability and wages. And that's uh, he, he showed us that graph. Um, and that suggests an important role for institutions like trade unions in helping workers capture a larger share of the profits, right? Otherwise, all of that rent ends up in the, in the, in the pockets of the, the owners of capital, and that's, and that's probably not what we want. Um, the, the one question I had there is in the one regression, uh, it seemed to be that, that much of that correlation disappears when controlling for capital stock. I don't know whether you've done more work on that, Isan, but I, but I think that really matters. Um, not because, I mean, the, the, the result clearly stands, clearly there is this correlation, people who work for more profitable firms earn higher wages, right? We know that, but, but to know whether that's a rent sharing story, I think we need to rule out some alternative hypothesis. For example, that, that firms just have different technologies, right? Something like complementarity between skilled labor and capital, I think would give you the same result and is also consistent with this, the sorting of higher skilled workers into, into higher paying firms that, that appear by the face of it to also have more capital. So I, so I think that would be that would be interesting to see. Um, secondly, at least in the paper that I wrote, uh, the next thing that his son looks at is evidence of, of monopsonistic wage setting power. So the, the first bit of evidence there comes from uh, a result that firms that are important employers in an area industry sell uh, don't pay much lower wages. So, so that's evidence against monopsony. So there is a relationship, but it's not very strong. Um, I'm in, in that regression, I'm a little bit concerned about the, the concentration measures. So one of the things that, that if I understand the tax data correctly is you don't actually know where the workers work, right? So my understanding is that all 100,000 uh, 100, shop right workers will be treated as if they compete in Cape Town um, Whereas, because that's where ShopRite is registered as a tax entity, but but most most people will be will be kind of dispersed in the country. And if if that's the case, uh, I think that could explain why the correlations that you're finding isn't stronger, right? So so I'm not convinced that this is evidence against uh, uh, monopsonistic uh, wage setting power. And then the other bit of evidence comes from the fact that that Isan sees that firms with higher firm effects suffer fewer separations, and that's exactly what we'd expect in a in a uh, uh, in a model with monopsony, uh, monopsony power. Again, my, I think there my concern is the same as it was in the previous uh, analysis. I, I'd, be, I'd be very interested to see what happens when you control for firm size and capital, because I think, I think that relationship is also what's predicted by some other models, and, and it would be just useful to, to rule out uh, some of the alternative hypotheses. So, so just some final thoughts. I, I think this is a very important contribution. I'm going to be thinking this over for the next for the next few months, definitely. I think the descriptive results are very interesting. And so 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 estimating these models, I know, isn't easy. And I think, uh, Esan, you were very transparent and very rigorous. And I and I and I and, and I think so. So that part of the paper is great. The, the tricky thing is when we try to understand why exactly these firm, firm effects exist. Right. So so you make the point that monopsony power fits the data very well, and I think that's true. We also know there's a bunch of other things about monopsony power that fits well with, with um, you know, other things in the South African labor market. We know that we have very high transportation costs. We know there are big information asymmetries. So my, my assumption before I read the paper is that monopsony is probably a big deal, but it'd be, it'd be, it'd be great to see whether that, that's the main thing or whether it's just kind of incidental. And, and I think as things stand, it's not clear to me that we can rule out things like efficiency wages, job search models, differences in technology. And, and it, it, I think it's very difficult to know exactly what the most effective policies are uh, to respond to, the, to, the, to your demonstration that these firm effects are really important um, uh, and, until, we, until we have more clarity about why exactly these firm, ex uh, firm effects exist. And that's it. Stop Thank you so much, uh, Rudolf, uh, for your insights. Um, let's open the floor for some additional Q and A's. Uh, 
Okay, JC. Hi, um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so thanks, Desan. Um, I guess, uh, uh, Rulof, I'll, the things I have to say are sort of elaborations on things that Rulof, uh, like what the counterfactual is when people say firm effects explain this much of the variance or whatever. Like firms differ in a bunch of ways. Some are have good managers, some have a lot of capital, some are located in, uh, you know, close to their, um, close to their customers. All of these things can create uh, differences in, in profitability. So uh, when you say it explains 43% of wage inequality, like what's the counterfactual exercise that you have in mind? Like, are we going to make all firms have exactly the same amount of capital and randomly sort managers across firms? Like, I just want to know like what, what, what the counterfactual is that you have in mind. Um, and then the second point that I wanted to make was that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of stress on, on unions uh, as, a, as a potential explanation for monopsony power now. Uh, I don't want to take a stand on exactly how much monopsony power there is. Obviously, that's sort of the substance of, of this paper. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, when you start speculating about what the policy solutions are, it, it, it was, I think, a notable omission was that you didn't even think about sort of supply side policies. Like, why not? Like, the, if if you really think that the the labor market is is really characterized by a lot of monopsony, uh, real like radical openness to trade and deregulation, uh, so that you get lots of new entrant new entrants into as on the employer side would would be a potential solution. Um, so that, I mean, I, I, I don't think that this is, obviously this is speculative, but uh, we, as, as we've, we've noted, there's, you know, the, there's lots of models to, to potentially use to think about the situation and, and we aren't quite sure which one is, which one is most relevant. Um, so anyway, that's my, that's my comment. Isan, would you like to uh, respond to JC's uh, as well as Rudolf's uh, points. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks so much for, for these, these um, extremely valuable and interesting comments. Really appreciate it. Um, so just to pick up a couple of, uh, is, I might miss things, but, but uh, to start off with, uh, Rudolf, your, your question around uh, what to do about uh, capital specifically. And it's something that that result is quite striking. So when you control for capital, the um, the the, the uh, ratio elasticity does decrease substantially. But it's difficult to know what to make of that for two reasons. One reason is that the test here is whether a worker at a, a high capital firm um, uh, is able to go to, uh, sorry, the, the, the firm wage premium that, that, is, that is calculated for a high capital firm is calculated on a worker that is working at that high capital firm and is able to, uh, and then switches to another firm and what the, 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 the wage penalty or gain is associated with that. So it's really kind of looking uh, within workers that actually do work at those, at those firms. And, you know, <laughs> one point here is that in, 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 in theory, at least in a, in a very competitive labor market, we'd expect even if, if two firms, one high capital, one low capital, uh, you know, share the same labor market, uh, then there should, be, there should be no firm wage premium, uh, regardless of capital. As you say, a, a um, threat to this is the, is the kind of complementarity between these skilled labor and capital and, and whether that messes up with the, messes with the, with the estimation and need to think a bit more about that. Um, the second point I want to make about capital is that one kind of hesitation of controlling for capital is that uh, it might be, the, uh, the, the rent sharing might be kind of endogenous towards the capital. So for example, uh, unions might uh, um, uh, bargain differently 
in terms of rents, if we think unions is the correct model versus monopsony, uh, when there are when there are high capital firms due to kind of like um, capital holdup, for example, um, uh, you know, and, and and it's anyway the implications of that is not clear for the estimates because you know it can increase it or decrease it. Um, but as you say, I, I think it's something important to disentangle. Um, just quickly on the uh, on 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 Jesse's questions. Uh, thanks so much, Jesse. Um, uh, I agree. It's kind of it's, <laughs> it's like a wild kind of counterfactual to say, oh, wh what do we do if we add no firm wage premium at all? Um, but in my mind, kind of, if we accept that uh, labor markets that are really competitive allow workers to switch whenever they want to, and we accept that these firm wage premium really are measuring kind of uh, rents that similar workers can get if they were able to switch, then it doesn't seem like an unfair counterfactual to me. Um, in, in this kind of world where you have a very competitive labor market, you could still have lots of kind of uh, heterogeneity along the firm margin for all sorts of other reasons due to kind of, uh, you know, stuff in the, in, the, in the product market going on or so on. Um, and which will in some ways interact, but at least in principle, I, I think if I have it right, um, you, you, could, you could have a, a perfectly competitive kind of labor market where you have uh, you know, negligible firm wage premium uh, with, as you say, even though some firms have, have great managers and others don't. Uh, and then lastly, on the, on the policy implication, um, I mean, just one thing is that I think and, and as, as Rulof says, this is like a, a, a thing that we, it would be great to get more investigation on. And it's uh, one of the reasons I really like uh, Rulof, your paper on the reference letters, is that I think for, for South African labor market, a lot of the monopsony power is driven by uh, things to do with uh, um, not on the kind of, not necessarily on the, on the employer side in terms of, for example, the number of entrants that exist. So as I said earlier, you get the, the situation where even in highly dense urban kind of uh, industry cross locations, you can still have a lot of monopsony power, kind of, uh, which kind of implies that, that uh, the number of firms doesn't solve the problem. Uh, a lot of the problem can come down to something like uh, just your ability to, 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 to search at all, uh, stuff like transport, uh, uh, as Rilov mentioned earlier. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, but I mean, all of the comments are, uh, I mean, extremely um, helpful and lots to think about. Thank you. Isan, maybe a question from my side. Um, so it relates to the point that Rulof made about um, like ShopRite is registered and they have their headquarters in Cape Town. Um, but obviously we have many ShopRites dispersed throughout the country. Would it then make sense for you to work on the PAYE, the branch level, instead of the yeah, uh, in the data, the tax reference number? Yes, so this is actually estimated at the branch level uh, in, the, okay. in the updated version, which is not yet posted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but yes, precisely for that reason, I, I switched to the, to the branch level uh, to get okay. a, a finer, finer indication of location. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Do we have any other questions or any other comments? Um, Andrew Donaldson, I see you have another point in the chat. If you would like to elaborate on it, you're very welcome. Uh, well, uh, uh, hello. So it's not so much a point in the chat. It's just a question on uh, Ifsan on how you interpret the events, upwards uh, moves of those from lower quartile uh, uh, wage firms to higher. Uh, alongside movements down um, uh, of, 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 of workers from uh, higher wage firms. So that the, these may not be, there's, there's an asymmetry between these two moves. You know, one, if one wanted to pose a human capital explanation or an individual productivity explanation, you could say that workers moving up are likely to be uh, more productive workers who succeed in finding higher uh, paying employment, workers who move down are possibly being pushed out or are more likely to be the consequence of employer 
initiated terminations. Um, is that something that uh, uh, that 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 comes into your um, interpretation of the results? Uh, if I can answer, Melis, um, that's that's definitely something that that I, that I uh, discuss. Um, and so, a kind of the, the two tests that I that I do in order to guard against exactly those kind of of uh, possibilities. The first test is that in, if you remember that graph. Uh, which showed exactly those quartile switches, the pre-event uh, kind of trend of these people is actually flat. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's showing that it's, it's not like they're on particularly different wage trajectories before they switch. And so which gives a little bit of confidence that uh, these might be kind of, uh, 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 you know, not two different uh, workers. And the second, I think more rigorous test is, is that kind of matching. Um, that, that I showed you in the second kind of piece of evidence for firm wage premium, where we really do a lot of, where I really um, uh, uh, um, match quite finely and show a long pre-period of something like six years, um, uh, including other firms, uh, to show that kind of, they aren't, it's, they're not systematically different wage, uh, of, of, you know, firm wage trajectories. So these aren't picking up, as you say, people that are higher, that are you know climbing up the, the the job ladder versus climbing down the job ladder, uh, which in my mind certainly does happen, but I don't think that this uh, that's that's biasing these estimates of the firm, firm wage premium. Um, I see there's a comment, uh, Marilise, uh, by uh, Cheryl. Um, yes, it should, just should came I go in. ahead and? Yes, please. Okay, let me just uh, read it for for the for everyone. Um, uh, do you have insights, any insights to share from the data uh, uh, on within or versus between uh, uh, firm effects? Can some results and patterns be seen in wage ratios between executives and the low, lowest paid workers within firms? And linked to Emma Donaldson's input, would institutional architecture not have the opposite effect? So um, I'm going to be speaking out of scope here. <laughs> um, I, I can't really say that much about, uh, you know, with, with, within firms. Um, maybe I looked at it at some point, but I, I, it's not, you know, part of the main study. But to talk about the, the institutional architecture, um, yeah, I do think that these bargaining councils, for example, and, and that's really what I'm, I'm spending most of my research time uh, working on now, um, uh, bargaining councils really do have a, a large effect on these, uh, uh, on, on this dispersion of firm wage premium. In some ways, um, it could increase these firm wage premium. Uh, um, if you think about, uh, you know, what types of firms are in these uh, these bargaining accounts tend to be higher wage firms, and so even if you make um, firm wage premium more 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 uniform within the bargaining council, it means that it's more uniform but but more differentiated from the lower paid uh, uh, firms, and so that means that uh, you get higher inequality on net. Uh, on the other hand, in some labor markets, it's it's creating more more uh, more equality uh, because it means that within that industry. You're getting more uniformity, uh, and um, as something which I'm really investigating right now, uh, which is uh, there are these substantial uh, spillover effects uh, from bargaining councils uh, due to monopsony, uh, monopsonistic competition, uh, which really uh, spills over onto the labor structure, as you say, the architecture, uh, um, uh, which kind of yeah has effects on equality. Juries out and higher inequality or, or less. <laughs> Sherilyn, does that um, answer? Do you have any comments? No, I, I just, I'm fascinated by it. And I think like Rulof says, it, it makes for lots of thinking over the next few weeks and months. Definitely. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Isan, for um, a really insightful presentation. Um, I'm very excited to read an updated version of the paper once it's done. Um, Rudolf, thank you to you for, um, for your discussion, uh, which is also very insightful. And thank you to all of the participants um, for joining today. And have a wonderful afternoon.